Hey Pickleballers, and welcome to another episode of the Pickle Bros Podcast. As always, thank you for your likes, comments, subscriptions, messages, and use code PICKLEBROS at checkout with Carbon for 10% off of your order. Today, we're going to be talking about, or asking the question, are you a stupid pickleball player? I know that some of us are. This is going to be a, a light row session, but also talking strategy, pickleball IQ, and just suggestions for how to improve your play and not be so stupid. But before we get into that, we had another event yesterday, a surprise event for our guy, Stolp. Because I don't know if you listeners uh, may have remembered or not, but he did this small, non not big issue with his liver, you know, donating it to his brother. And so we just had to celebrate him on his way back. Wow. That's, oh, yeah, and we have tape. We got the video. Here it before, is. Before we hit play, let me just start by saying, um, if you've never been part of a surprise where you are the, the guest of honor, you, everyone's, the reaction that comes out, you do not expect what your your mind, body, and heart is going to do or say. So when we watch <laughs> this, it just truly unfolds into this moment of what is going on. So roll the clip. parts of that is like this is what we do now we just <laughs> throw surprise or, uh, parties and play pickleball and i was so <laughs> thrown for a loop and and to my came to my understanding like this was planned for a while wanted it to happen um weeks ago and so that added to the to the surprise because clearly i was not thinking this this was what i was walking into um, and all of your good friends are there and, um, we had a great time, didn't we? Wasn't that so cool? Just awesome. getting, to, getting to hang out with, with all of our pickle, pickle bros and, and, uh, their, their, some of their family too. It was a really, really great time. And, and Ian kind of shared with his surprise book launch, there's just so much love in that room and, and, um, you don't feel deserving. That was a good way to put it, Ian. Like, it's just, it's just something that, I don't know. I'll, I'll treasure forever. And I don't know. It, was, it felt undeserving, but it's such a great time. Thank you guys so much. Two things I love so much is the first comment you made about uh, you don't know what you're going to say or how you're going to react. And that's so true. Like I relate. I mean, just being the recipient of my own surprise party, you there's no prep. There's no pre thinking. It's just like and, and you're so scared and caught off guard that all this loud noise and then you're like you're, you're in fight or flight mode. But then you see that your friendly face is who you love. So your, your body doesn't actually know what to do or how to feel with the adrenaline. And so that just cracked me. I could see it in you. I love that. And the second thing was you coming in and like, of course, instantly you find the pickleball shoes and the pickleball bag. And that's what you're looking at as you're walking in the hallway. <laughs> yeah, Cause what was teed up to me is like, we're going to this couple's dinner um, with one, one, the, the couple whose house that I've never been to, which, which I was walking into I see the pickleball stuff. I'm like, oh, all right. We're going to have some things to talk about. We're going to have some common ground. Like, this is going to go great. And then I turn around and see everybody. And I'm like, what? I couldn't comprehend. And then I'm, I look at Sarah. I'm like, wait, who's this for? And then they're like, you. And then I was like, what did I do? And someone's like, you gave your liver. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it was just, that was great. Good job, you guys. Yeah, I wonder what Tim and I are going to have to do to get our surprise party. I don't think I don't think I'm writing a book or giving away any organs. I don't know, but I'm going to walk around with a note card in my hand so I can have some thoughts on hand, so I can actually have something to say. That's funny. Actually, <laughs> after we came home from the party last night, my wife and I looked at each other and we we vowed 
not to do any surprise parties because because she would not enjoy being a, a surprisee, I guess. So Okay, more, noted. More... <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. So that was so great, Stolp. But we're gonna keep pushing on with the show. And we have another slight change we're making to the show. Everyone, all you listeners, everybody loves our beefs. Well, what's your beef? It's such a great segment. But we realized we were being a little limited in that we were only kind of being Debbie Downers, curmudgeons, negative. And so we wanted to add in a whole other slew of what we can say. So the segment is having a slight twist. It's now going to be beef or no beef. And no beef is just going to be a very similar train of thought, but something positive, happy, good, uplifting. Because we need that kind of balance in our life. So Stolp, fresh on the heels of of you being the party man, you got a beef or no beef this week? Yeah, it's funny. It's Well, I'm going to be curious to go around here and see who has a positive. Because I actually have a beef, but but I, I, I'll just throw it out there. The no beef has to be. And we don't have to do both. But, but on the heels of this party, that was, again, I'm just going to reiterate, such a joy, such, such a pleasure, such a fun thing to do. So, so you can't start a, hey, we're going to do a segment where you can include positives. And I can't say that. So, so that's, and I'm a glass half full positive guy all the time. But it, that being said, I'm going to go against all of what I just, <laughs> just alluded to. And I have a beef. Um, I have a beef with Selkirk Power Air paddles. And it's not because of the product that it is in the pickleball paddle. And I'm sure it's great. And what Tim uses it, it's nothing to do with that. It's everything to do with the paint marks it leaves after oh, paddle tapping. Yes. I paddle tap Selkirk Power Airs, and then I'll try and clean my carbon or whatever paddle I'm using with the paddle eraser. That paint stays on, and it's only the Selkirk Power Air white one that does that. And so... I can tell the days I've played with Tim because it looks like a graffiti artist has been all over my paddle. Because um, we paddle tap. I'm I'm I am an over paddle tapper to a fault. Like oh, we make a mistake, paddle tap. We win a point, paddle tap. Like we're in a timeout, we're paddle tap, and it doesn't matter. And so that dang Selkirk Power Air leaves marks on my paddle like no other paddle does. So that's my beef. I will add to that that it also leaves marks on the wall when you hit the wall with it. <laughs> so, yeah, I definitely noticed that. It's like someone's been here on this wall with some graffiti. Yeah, that's excellent. Stolp, that's a good beef. Have you ever tried the reverse paddle tap where you offer up your handle? Mike Lee does that, um, and all the time. And no, I, I I I do it to humor him sometimes. I like the old fashioned high five too, like with your offhand that's what and and actually offhand high five to the paddle so that, maybe that's yep. my my solution is if i'm playing with selkirk power air, left hand paddle tap to my to my I, I stole that from eli i don't offer up my paddle anymore i put out my hand and i let them paddle tap me with their pad it's so much better i can and i do that too yeah this is a great topic actually it's because really of you to tim it's because of you what did i do you, you have a power air marring up. Oh, our, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this dude. This was a personal beef no. this morning. <laughs> uh, Jesse, again. Again. Yeah. Jesse, beef or no beef? Yeah. Let me just say, I like the new format. It's sort of a. It's a bit of an affirmative action program for some of the pickle bros have trouble coming up with beefs. So this expands the universe of options. No, I'm not gonna name any names, attacked. Ian. I'm not naming any names. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. So my beef, it's a, it, it's like the never-ending well uh, duper. Uh, no, it, I'm not complaining about their rating system this time. I'm complaining about their duper community guidelines, which they came out with last week. Uh, they said duper is committed to creating a safe and fair environment for all players and organizers. And then they talk about all the things that you can do that will get you suspended or banned. And uh, one of the things you can do is display unsportsmanlike conduct such as acts of aggression or property damage and I just thought of um, Tim hurling his paddle and Jason Moeller doing the same thing and I think Ian you've done that Nick Patterson's not, like pretty much almost everybody in our group is going to be suspended according to this policy so I'll be writing an email to Duper letting them know 
to suspend all of you guys. Um, and then, you know, some of this stuff I think is pretty reasonable. You're not supposed to manipulate ratings. You're not supposed to impersonate another player. Um, I think that, <laughs> that's, that's reasonable. That's you, Ian? <laughs> that's <laughs> what, you and Zane. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, hey, but this, one, this one really got my attention. It says, Duper upholds a zero-tolerance policy, no tolerance whatsoever, towards individuals who fail background checks. And um, I'm not really sure what they're talking about there. Um, do you guys know what they mean by background checks? It, it was the most bizarre thing in that email. Yeah, so, so Duper, can you, can you clarify that, please? Uh, until you do, I've, I've got a beef with that. And my community guideline for them is get your algo right before you start telling me how to live my life, bro. Let me fill my paddle. Get my ranking better first. Have you seen the movie Benchwarmers? It's so bad. It's the worst movie ever. But there's a scene where this man who's in his, like, clearly his mid-30s with a mustache, who's trying to play Little League Baseball, has a has a uh, piece of paper written in crayon that says, I am 12, and he hands it to the umpire. <laughs> I can play. So maybe that's what background checks are for. That's to, what check, like, need. To, to, to check your age so you don't uh, sandbag in, in age brackets. That's awesome. All right. I am obviously going with no beef, although Jesse's uh, pinpointing out my problem with beefs might have to be my new beef. Um, I'm no beef today, and it's because we have added three – new players into our core group ecosystem and they are so good um if you don't continue to innovate your group and push yourself and give new looks and create new 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 partnerships new duos then you are going to stagnate it is very hard to continue to progress if you just stay like if it was just the four of us and we only play together that will have less progression as us playing with the 20 guys or 25 guys who are now kind of in our four or five plus group. And the, some of the skills these guys are bringing, like, I mean, it, and we're also laughing because our group now is two Tims, two Eric's. Now we've got two Adams in our group, but Adam Layton, I mean, and, and solid player coming from a, a, a nice tennis background has the most beautiful two handed backhand I've ever seen. It is Riley Newman-esque in that it is his strong side. I put him on the right side with me. I let him run alpha with it. It's just really unique to watch, especially how he uses it. Um, Luke Lorenz, big time, you know, tennis background, all the way up to high level D1, has apparently won some matches on, on the men's pro tour. The dude's composure and ability to get shots back and how he moves on the court. Uh, and then Adam Oslowski is the same way. That's the guy from Denver, but he's coming down for our men's team event. The dude's 6'3", built like a linebacker, huge muscles. This is the biggest thighs, biggest calves I've ever seen. And again, just watching these guys and how they play, I'm like already just like, all right, I want to steal that from you. I want to steal that from you. I want to take that from you. And I'm telling, I'm going to be so much better just for having watched these guys, not just for what they can hit at me, but being next to them, knowing how they develop a point, you know, we, the, we can become chameleons. So my no beef is I love what we're doing with our group and continually innovating. I, I love that no beef. Um, and I, I would just contrast our group with some of the other ones we know of that, that tend to be very cloistered. And I do think that they stagnate as a result. So, so good on, on us for bringing in all this new talent. Yeah, absolutely. All right, and Tim. they're young. They are young yeah. hitters, man. Like, it's it's keeping up with the young guys. And see, and, and Ian, I loved how you pointed out things that you can take from them. Um, but then just the different looks you get as their opponent. Like, we we play a certain way and we see certain things. But once you see new new things and are, know how to adapt to them and challenge them, it just improves your game all over. So great, great no beef. Way to kick that off. Awesome. Timmy, beef or yeah. no beef? I'm going to add to your beef or your, your non-beef, your uh, vegetarian take. So I, you know, what we my have tofu here? take, yeah. you know, what we have here with all these great new players that are entering into our, our um, ecosystem and still, if you'll appreciate this, we have a farm system, you guys, mm. because when new really good players um, 
visit our area or move to our area, you know, sometimes it's hard to know who to play with, but uh, there are some groups that are more accessible than ours. And what they do is they catch on with those groups and we have an in with these groups that these new guys are playing with. They will let us know if there are players that are playing with them that are super good and need to be playing with us or some other groups that are like ours. And um, I think that's really cool. We'll get like a text message or a phone call from uh, one of our buddies over in those uh, lower groups. And they'll be like, this guy, you want to play with this guy? Cause he's like, he'll be right there at the top with uh, your guys's group. And it's like, okay, yeah, let's invite him to one of our early morning sessions. And that's what we did yesterday. And that's what Ian was talking about. And that's not the first time this has happened where somebody has, has sort of graduated from that, uh, that uh, lower group. And, and we've, uh, we've reaped the benefits of, of them playing with us. And it's just like, Ian and I were talking yesterday about, geez, we had like 20 to 25 really good players suddenly that I'd be happy to play with any day of the week. And a lot of times we'll play with eight or 12 people in the mornings and we just rotate through. And it's like, we keep adding people to that mix. And it's because of this great system we have. We have a farm system. It's actually to the point where it's like, I'm kind of worried that I won't be able to play with like, and by the way, all these guys are our friends, right? Like we, these guys, just the greatest group of guys we're putting together. I won't be able to see all of them as much because I got to spread my time around between them. And it's just like, I, I, I'm now getting this panicky mode. Like, do I need to host a 5 a.m. 16 man tournament? At, like, you, know, you just, you get all these ideas. It's just really cool. The options that we're able to, to draft from. And you're, yeah, you're right. Some of these, lower groups in in the city have connected with us and they're like we'll just we'll be your feeder programs you know once guys yeah. are ready to graduate we'll send them up to you yeah so awesome. that's my that's my non-beef that's awesome. awesome tim not to mention that um we are creating or snowballing on a movement of 5 a.m play i don't know how how normalized that is across the country but there's a solid group of whatever, 16 to 25 that are willing to wake up at 5 a.m. on any given day to play. And it's high level. Like that's also part of the legit farm system. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, guys, it's time to dive in. Are you a stupid pickleball player? Uh, Jesse, I want to toss it over to you first to open the discussion. What's the dumbest thing that you have done in pickleball this year? Uh, there's so many. There's so many. Uh, my list is long. But the dumbest thing I do on a consistent basis, pretty much every game, is uh, fail to let out balls go out. And I do it, and I berate myself, and I slap myself with the paddle, and I say, well, I won't do that again. And then 30 seconds later, I do the exact same thing. So. Nothing changes. <laughs> That's pretty dumb. Awesome. Stolp, what's the dumbest thing you've done this year? Yeah, so we hosted a episode on speed-ups a few weeks ago, and I keep mentioning this, uh, this commenter that said something along the lines of never speed it up on the bounce. So if you're in a dink, dink battle at the kitchen – and um, you think it's a good idea to speed it up on the bounce. It's not, it's not. And so my, my dumbest thing that I do and that I'm constantly battling internally is the step back dink speed up or speeding up off of the dink. Um, it's something that I've been working on tremendously and focusing on. And the truth of the matter is, is if you stay in the point and, and continue to dink and continue to, to create stressful dinks, you're going to be far more successful than taking a step back drive at somebody in front of you who is going to be talented enough to block um, and, and counter punch um, or get out of the way. Like Jesse said, like if you step back and drive and get out of the way, nine times out of 10, that ball's not going in. So rule and and let me also say though there are times where you can if a ball's dead in the middle and it's high bounce dink you can you can mix in an attack off of that i would say um but i'm talking about those ones in the back corner on your backhand if in the kitchen like 
there's no sense to take a step back and drive off of that. So that's the dumbest thing that I regularly do is to step back and try to attack a dink. Love that. Tim, why don't you jump in? Go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, if, if Jesse's stupidity had occurred to me, that would have been mine. Um, because, oh my gosh, you guys should have seen at the last team event, I was playing men's doubles with Mick and he, he scolded me, yelled at me on the court. It embarrassed me like crazy because, but I had, I had it coming because this thing was going over the fence. That's the thing with these leaves. Um, they're not even necessarily close to being in They're I just can't stay off of them. Like I'm like a dog trying to chase a fire uh, truck or something. Like I, I just can't stay off of them, but that's not even the stupidest thing I do. Well, it might be. It didn't occur to me, but the other stupid thing that I do is guys, I, I hate serving. I just mm. I hate it. It it's boring. I don't think about it. I'm like, okay, here we go. And I'm not ambitious when it comes to serving. I've just kind of let that part of my game go like, whatever, I'll just get it in. It's fine. I'll try to get it deep, whatever, try to get it over there in that corner or maybe down the tee this time. I don't know, but it's so, it's so boring to me. I'm so unimaginative when it comes to hitting it. And as a result, like I'll just step up and miss a bunch because I, I just don't care enough. I'm just like, let's, let's get this thing started. I hate doing this. I hate serving. I hate my serve. I hate serving. I hate the whole thing. I just want to start the point without serving somehow, but, <laughs> but I have to serve and it's stupid that I don't give it more, more, attention because I could be a lot better at it and I'm not, I just get it in. And a lot of times I don't even get it in because my attitude is so bad. Like a lot of times I'll be dwelling <laughs> on a point that just happened or something like, Ugh. and then I'll, I'll go to serve and I'll still be annoyed with what just happened and I'll hit it right into the net. And, and that, that just compounds my annoyance, but, but yeah, serving it's stupid. I don't, I'm not smart about it. I'm an idiot. When it comes to serving. Well, uh, okay, I have a question for for both you and Ian. Both of you guys have sort of average, just average serves. But oh, I remember I'm like four. Not average. What's that? It's not even average. Thanks for being gracious. For your level, it's like it's like below the rest of your game. But like four or five months ago, both of you guys were working on your serves. Like I remember it. And Ian, you we went to Banning Lewis, and you were practicing your serve, and it was really good. And Tim, you were same around the same time you were doing the, you were doing really good serves. So what happened? Yeah, that was the uh, that was the hangover from our Utah trip where we got to play with some pros, and they were man. Um, uh, Chuck was uh, Chuck Taylor was showing us his serve. And we we're all all blown away by just how he was hitting that thing. We're like, oh my gosh, I want to do that. And so I have adopted like I used to do it off the bounce. I don't do that anymore. I just dr I just drop it and hit it. So the motion is is similar to what I was working on after that trip, um, but there's nothing on it. Like I can't get any pace on it. I I can't get any spin on it. I'm just not really willing to miss my serves. I don't I don't go for that much. Now, ironically, I was just saying I miss it a lot because I'm I'm just I'm not thinking about it enough. So I, I don't know. If, I guess you can figure that one out. But I, um, I got two answers for why my serve is is terrible and the first one is because of any shot in pickleball you take you have the ability to line up compose yourself and your habit of of execution on the serve is the one that can always be the most precise right because after the serve <clears throat> excuse me everyone's moving you're in live play you have to adapt to things that might change but when you're serving that's the one thing you can con completely control without anyone else's influence. And I have found that when I get tired and I start playing longer, deeper into the session, that that goes down because I haven't solidified my process, my execution of the serve. I actually start the day serving great because I'm fresh. I can hit it well. I, but once the fatigue sets in, my form falls apart. Um, and then the second portion to that is I used to be the spin serve guy in town and then I met Jesse and then we were the spin serve guys. 
and it was like my identity and I was so good at it. And I've been ruined because I know what it's like to get six aces in a row. And, and it's similar to what Tim is saying where he gets bored. It's like, how, how do you, how can you ask me to actually put some effort into my serve when I'm coming from the, the heights, the mountaintop, <laughs> and now you want me to live in the valley with the rest of you plebs? Like, like I was, I was king. <laughs> I was king of the serve and they took it from me. Nothing will ever even remotely come close to satisfying me again in that same way. So it's just, it's, it's just kind of ruined for me. Is, I'm, is how I'm not going to lie. I like hearing you guys talk about how bad your serves are. <laughs> I have the worst serve on this foursome, like times a million. And um, so I, I'm fairly interested to hear that you're bored Tim at serving and you don't think you're good. And I, I, I can distinctly remember recent times where they give me trouble and maybe it's not because of pace, it's because of placement. And um, so one of the things that I've been working on, and Ian, you mentioned fatigue, like I'm going to go ahead and say that no matter how tired you are, you could hit a decent serve, maybe not with pace, but maybe with precision. And so one of the things, cause, cause I, this episode was, was, talked about and decided on because I'm doing a lot of stupid things, listeners. I'm the one. I'm the problem. It's me. Um, and one of my problems was serving. One of my other problems was returning. And what I came to find out or I'm learning um, through this is focus. Like uh, just not, you don't have to be ultra focused all the time, but just think about what you're doing. And for me, my surf sucks. I'm the worst on this call or on, on this, on this screen. So what I've been working on is just deep serves, get them deep, get them in with your returns, get them deep, get them in. It doesn't necessarily have to be a hundred percent perfect every time, but with minor amounts of focus, you can see success. And so Ian, with, with your fatigue, I swear, if you just focus a little bit and you're like, Oh, I'm tired. I should recognize that. Yep. That's a cue for me to focus. Your serves will be fine because that's what I'm trying to do with myself. And then I'm going to drill it and try and get some pace on it. But that's interesting to hear your struggles are with serves fellas. Cause I'm, yeah. I'm living that world too. You're a million percent right. And I love this conversation. Cause it's like when Jesse talking about out balls, it's like, if I could, be a hundred percent certain on all like if, or if I could make the judgment a hundred percent of the time, I would genuinely probably never lose a game, you know? And, and the serving thing now speed ups are never a problem for me because I just, I can't do them effectively. So I've not fallen victim to that stupidity, but my stupid thing I've done this year, and I don't know if you guys will have recognized this or known this. I'd love for your uh, commentary after I reveal it. And that is going to be, I pre decide whether I'm going to drive or drop it before the return ever comes at me mm. because I'm very pattern oriented. I know what works. I know if I drop it here, these sequence of shots will likely play out. But if I drop it here, these sequence will likely play out. And so I actually have built in these pre-constructed points in my brain. And once I get up to the net, it's much easier to control those variables and like, Oh, so now we're moving in this direction, right? Like, my brain's really weird that way, but I will decide what I'm going to do prior to the return coming at me. And sometimes I'm like, I'm going to drop it. Oh no, that ball should have been a, a driven ball or the opposite. And I get locked in and I don't change my mind and I don't deviate and messing it up. Like half the drives that go long, Jesse, are because I should be dropping them, but I was predetermined that I was going to drive that ball. So that's something I'm still, I, I just can't seem to break out of because of the way I play. I pre-decide things instead of actually reacting to what's in front of me. And it's, it's the dumbest thing ever. Hmm. Yeah, I think I do that on the return a lot. I'll just decide, well, I'm going to hit a slice return no matter what this serve looks like, no matter how deep it is, no matter if it's to my forehand or my backhand, I'm going to hit a slice and that's all there is to it. Hmm. And I get into trouble so often with that mindset. Um, but I mean, if you're not doing that, like you're asking a lot out of yourself to have, uh, you know, some pretty quick uh, processing speeds going on so that you can adjust on the fly and hit the right shot. I mean, that's what pickleball is though. I mean, you have to be processing yeah. really quickly, but um, I think that's pretty normal to just, you know, have a, a, 
a predetermined idea of what you're going to do with a certain shot, like especially if you've got a little bit of time to hit it. Um, in your case, you're talking about thirds. So you know you're going to get a third. You're just waiting for that, that return to come back. And for me, on the return, I'm just waiting for that serve. I know I'm going to get a serve. So I'm going to try to slice this one. But I think the smarter thing to do is, well, what am I going to be working with here? What kind of serve am I going to be working with here? What kind of return are you going to be working with? And just try to process as, as quickly as possible as that ball is on its way to you and and hit the most sensible shot, not the planned shot. No, no. That's funny to me, Ian. Your, your your stupidity is you're you're too smart, so you're dumb. Like you think you're yeah. you're thinking about how to construct your points before they even happen, and it's just like, you guys, I'm just too so smart stupid. that that I'm so dumb. <laughs> like I can't be doing that. That's that made me laugh. I'm a before, truther. Okay. Yeah. Hey, before we move to the next uh, question here, I have one more dumb thing that I do, yeah. and I and so it's funny, uh, and I want to bring it up because. Yesterday, playing with with Adam, um, I didn't get to play with Luke, but I played against him, and he is a tremendous talent. I'm I'm really glad that he's going to get mixed in. But I played with Adam as my partner twice, and I always have to I always have to introduce my my pickleball game to people in certain ways. And so it's always, hey Adam, I have a toxic trait, and I'm <laughs> I am I am over aggressive, and I will do things by taking your balls that that are clearly yours and i will steal them from you and i'm apologizing in advance i'm really really sorry because my toxic trait is i am overly aggressive and i apologize and so i get that out front and we kind of laugh about it but then you know as the game plays out he, he sees that in action and one of the things that i will do is so i'm always looking to poach i'm always looking to take a forehand and so i'll go over and if it's a little too far I will act like I'm going to swing and then I'll just bail at the last second. And so, and so, and then things, bad things will happen from that. Cause you're faking out your partner and I, they're not ready. I, I, I deke out my partner. And so when, when Seth, another fine player who's been mixed into our group, I really, really enjoy Seth. He's gotten this experience this firsthand, but these, these guys are really, really talented to make, you talk about fast processing and judgment. They can do that, but like it takes it takes a good amount of time playing with me to understand that. And once we do understand it, it can actually be a good tactic. It's like a offensive screen where I get in front of them and then back out, and then they can they can put a, a good play on it. But if you don't play with me, I have to say, hey man, look, I have a toxic aggressive trait, and I will bail at the last second, and you are going to get mad about it. I'm sorry. It's funny you say this, Dolph. You know what I do when I play with you? Hmm. I dial myself down to 0.7x, 0.75x speed, whatever, like three-quarter speed, because I know that very thing will happen, that you're just going to be all over the place, playing fast, doing your thing, and then or, – or you'll go for an Ernie. Oh, I need to I need to pick this up, right? Like I need to – jump over and dink it back and like i'm just always ready to have to to hit a weird ball because of all your activity mm -hmm. yeah in, in my opinion a good beta is ready for that and that the the alpha is going to bail out sometimes and you you just got as the beta you have to be ready that's your job yep 100 percent. well because uh, if, if i tone that to if i if i play non-alpha and and that's the agree agreement with the beta that I'm going to be the alpha. If, if I tone that down, there's not going to be success. I I've tried that to be like, oh, I'm going to calm myself down, not be so aggressive. It doesn't work out as well as you think. I have to be active. I have to move off ball. I have to take forehands. If we're playing this true alpha beta thing. Now, if we get two alphas together, like Tim and I, we have to have a conversation before the fact, like, hey, what are we going to do? Who's going to do what? Who's taking when? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And Tim and I do have those conversations and defer to each other in different different scenarios. But it's a conversation that has to be had with every one of my partners. And it's a toxic trait. I'm sorry out there to everyone who I've offended with my toxic, toxic aggressiveness. All right. So in terms of Stolp's dumbness, his stupidity rubbing off on us, what's the dumbest thing someone else has done to you on the court this year? Jesse, I want to throw it back to you again, kicking us off here. Uh, okay. I, I may have complained about this already in some previous episode, but the, the dumbest thing I see in pickleball, and you see it 
you see it both on the court and you see it in the Facebook forums, is the the people who don't like the man to be overly overly aggressive in mixed doubles, and you know you see it like every few weeks somebody will post some video of Riley Newman jumping all over the court, and then the all the 2.5 and 3.0 armchair quarterbacks chime in about how he needs to trust his partner more and. This is so obnoxious, and I'm like, really? You're, you're giving Riley Newman advice. Okay. Um, but then these same people get on the court, and they'll say things like, well, I'm fine with you poaching as long as you don't miss. I'm like, if you, if you want to, to design a statement to repel good male mixed doubles players, keep saying that, because that's what it's going to do. Yes, um, and, and we have a... Some direct experience, Jesse, with some of our mixed partners <laughs> adopting that phraseology for us, and then it scares you. You're just like, I don't know what you actually want me to do. Like, do well, I they, have to have... they want you to stay on your side of the court, and so you're not going to get any. Look, I'm generalizing, but usually when we play mixed doubles, the man is the stronger player. So, 95% of the balls are going to go to the female, and um, the the man will be iced out, and you're going to lose. So that's, that's low IQ pickable. I love that. I love that. I'm actually going to go here, jump in, and, and the dumbest thing someone else has done to me this year, and it's fresh off of the heels of Stolp talking about speed-ups, and Tim in recent episodes has talked about, why do I do it off the bounce? Why, 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 why do I keep doing this thing over and over? I actually have to thank you, Tim, for unlocking my superpower. You know, like, like the mutants in X-Men, it's like they have that one – catalyzing event that kicks off their superpowers you did that for me tim when louie and i were playing you and jess in that duper league match and you relentlessly attacked me like just shot after basically every touch you had it felt like you were trying to speed it up and tag me or pass me right into my body and my counters were on that day and it kind of showed me what i could do and so this, the dumb stuff people do is now that my secret has kind of gotten out is when people challenge me with speed up. So like, like you've done it, uh, Jason Moeller in that one tournament, he and I have this joke. We both knew based on who his partner was and who my partner was that it was going to come down to him and me, me on the left side, him on their right side. So we're straight in front of each other, two goats on a bridge. He was going to speed it up at me and I was going to counter punch it back at him. And we, we, we even laughed before, like, we knew it was coming, may the best man win. And, and I got the advantage that day. And so, but as I'm kind of unlocking this and getting better and better at it, people still trying to attack me is, is and again, we just talked about how smart, I'm so smart that my patterns, that I see stuff, I knew what you were thinking. It's like, I'm good at giving myself this subtle praise, but it's like, I'm, I'm legitimately good at this skill. And people shouldn't, there's a lot of ways to beat me. There's actually a lot of ways to beat me, but this is not one of them. And recently I've been seeing a ton of it and like, and I love it, but I just don't think it's smart pickleball given that my gift is no longer a secret. So that, that, that's what I got to say. I love that. I do love that. You said uh, my, <laughs> the dumbest thing I've seen is people coming at me, bro. Come at me, bro. I love that. Um, but you know, I, as a, as a, a constant speeder upper, it's like you in your head, you're like, oh, yeah, this guy's really good at countering my, my speed ups, but he ain't seen my speed up. Like, <laughs> I'm going to try him. And, and dude, I have come at you every time we play and, and with very little success. So I, we never learn our lessons either. So blockhead alphas like that we don't we don't we have short term memories and like to speed up regardless. Stall, keep rolling. What's uh? Yeah. Yeah. I got the dumbest thing I've seen this year and it's, it's tennis players, dude, like no offense to all the tennis players out there, but they come No, out, Great offense. We, we yeah, mean offense. Yeah. Maybe we do because we come, they come out here and a lot of the tennis players rise to the cream of the crop in, in, in our groups and have tennis backgrounds, like once they learn, but when they first come out, they do the dumbest stuff. Like they love to bang. They love to play like, like they're playing singles tennis matches. The, the dumbest shot in particular that I see all that often is like this backhand slice, like, um, 
it's 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 totally a tennis shot and it's effective when when used correctly but it's overused when they first come it's it's a, it's a backhand slice that that has far too much spin and is wildly erratic and it takes a long time to get that that muscle memory away from a tennis player to actually you know learn how to drop with your backhand or or you know just just a normal backhand um a pickleball backhand versus versus this weird paddle angle with with a slice so yeah that shot uh, works on the tennis court it doesn't work on the pickleball court. it doesn't and 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 it's like try and try again it's you you almost get frustrated for them it's like seriously dude knock it off <laughs> let's get let's uh let's let's uh drill that out of you and and then what happens is it they drill it and they get better and they pass you up. <laughs> and so, and so we've seen, we've seen a lot of tennis players come in with their tennis skills that don't translate to pickleball, but they wise up over time and get better. But it's just funny to me that the, the tennis players first who think that pickleball is not a serious sport, I'm going to use all these skills and translate them into pickleball. It just doesn't work like that. Hmm. Tim, what's the dumbest thing you've seen or dumbest thing that's been done to you on the court? Um, I have a couple of things. Um, the one that you guys will uh, recognize and appreciate is people that drive while moving forward. Because like, here's the thing. It, it's just, it's so stupid. And we're all kind of guilty of it, I think, at one time or another, you know, because we're in that aggressive mindset and we're trying to get into the net. Oh, but here's a shot I can attack, so I'm going to drive it. But it, it it really is just really stupid and counterproductive because what's the guy at the net doing off your drive? He's blocking it, right? He's blocking your drive. Do you have a better chance of handling his block if you're giving yourself some space, or do you have a better chance handling it if you're moving forward actively? You have a better chance if you're just stopped and you're surveying the scene and seeing what you have to work with. But so many people will just hit that shot while moving forward. And it's just, it's really dumb. But the other thing that I was going to say, if I could add on, is uh, there are people obviously that they favor their forehand. I mean, I'd say it's most uh, most players. They favor their forehand. So if they're dealing with a, a third shot, they're about to hit a third shot and say, and I see this a lot from one person in particular, <laughs> Um, they're, they'll be on the left side. Uh, they're an alpha and they, they get the return. And for most people that should be their backhand, but this person, their foot behind the baseline, they're going to run around their backhand and try to drive their forehand from way back there. And I'm just like at the net, I'm like, thank you. We're about to win this point. This is great. This is awesome. This will be so easy because I've got plenty of time to space. look at this drive, plenty of time to look at this drive, and you're giving up so much space with all the running around your backhand that you're doing. So I can put this thing like 12 different places and it's going to win the point. And I don't know what possesses people to do that. <laughs> like I wouldn't, I really, I try not to do that. Now, a walk in that position is a smart shot, you know, because it's not moving as fast and it's, it's probably cross court, it's dipping, that'll give you some time. But a flat out like hard hit drive from that passing drive is so stupid. You can't do that. You just can't. Um, even if you want to hit that with your backhand, that's, I mean, that's okay because you're not at a position for the next shot, but your forehand from that angle is, is really stupid. And I see it. I see it more often than, you know, we should at our level. Yeah. I love that. And you, people will run around it because they don't trust their backhand. And, and I mean, yes, I understand. I'm, 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 backhand biased i'm a little bit i mean backhand biased players are rare but they're not like so rare that they like you know you, you'd never come across them but yeah just develop your backhand a little bit so you don't have to be so out of position and tim another thing you said that i thought you're going this direction to come up running while you hit your drives i i didn't even consider what your opponent's going to do i consider when i'm moving forward and i hit a drive i'm either going to hit it down into the net because I'm getting to that ball too soon and I'm rolling over mm, it, yeah. or I'm just going to just chunk through it and it's going to just, just soar. So that's why you have to stop before you base, or at least have a steady base before every hit. 
And I, I'm really trying to work on like when you, when you run up to the net off like a, a, a net dribble or like a weak kill shot from Louie or Stolp, you guys have these weird forehand slices. I really try not to be aggressive with those balls because I have to be moving while I hit them, but I just, I baby them over and then try and get back out of the kitchen. Like, so yeah, th- th- that's where I thought you were going, but, but your point is also after you hit that drive, what are you doing? You're, you're running into the ball that they're hitting back at you. Like not wise, not wise. Um, where, where are we here? Sorry, boys. Oh, so what do you do that is really smart? And now I've already, you know, I, I've, I've patted myself on the back too much. So Jesse, I'm going to hand it over to you again. You keep kicking us off here. What's something you do that's really smart and pickleball that you think more people should adopt? So uh, one thing I do, I think it's pretty smart, is I'm very adept at changing the stack on the fly, depending on what's unfolding in front of me. Mm. Uh, Stolp and I u- utilized this at our tournament back in June. There was a particular player that I wanted to be in front of. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of people, they're familiar with stacking. You know, I'll be on the left, you be on the right. Maybe they do that in mixed, sometimes they do it in men's. But you can stack more creatively than that. There might be a particular p- person that you want to cross court dink with. Or there might be somebody that you want to dink straight ahead to. And um, I'm very, very comfortable with, with that. And it, it's proven to be effective. That is so true. That's so true. Stolp, what, what's your smartness? We know that you don't have a lot of smirks. <laughs> but what's your smirk? Take it easy there, freaking nerd. I got this. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I think... I do two things that I wanted to call out one that's unique to me and maybe other people with very long wingspans. Um, This is not for everybody. Uh, But what I can do very well that I think is smart when when executed on the right shot is take dinks out of the air because, okay, so I said the dumb thing is don't don't speed up on the bounce, but I can speed up in the air on a dink and some, some people who um maybe or people who have and have not played with me will quickly learn that my wingspan can reach past the middle of the kitchen and so if you don't have a really aggressive dink i'm going to reach in and i'm going to punch volley that especially with my backhand so i'm going to backhand punch volley what you think is a good dink and split you down the middle and you're not going to be ready for it so anyone out there Anyone out there who who has a big wingspan and gets in dink battles, I would encourage you to look for ones that you can attack out of the air and and take your opponents um, by surprise. Because no matter how good they are at defense, they're not going to be expecting a, a non-attackable dink to be taken out of the air uh, for a finisher. So so that's something that I think is is unique to me. Um, Drives me crazy, by the way. I hate it so much. <laughs> same, was I hit, same. Very I hit frustrating. I a good dink on you, and all of a sudden it's coming back in my face. Uh, my paddle's uh, not prepped. It shouldn't be happening. It's so, uh, it's so yeah. demoralizing. It oh is. Oh, my gosh. Well, and that makes me happy to, to make you guys mad because that's what I'm trying to do. So that's, that's <laughs> one thing unique to me. I, again, not everyone can do that. Um, one thing everyone can do that I think is, is a utilizable uh, shot is when you're in an overhead head exchange and they're defending it back. So you have two, two of your opponents back at the baseline, just playing defense and they're maybe popping it up and you and, or your, your uh, partner are, are smashing it. Um, and maybe just not getting that advantage with the right angle. Try a nice little soft tap with your paddle to just put it into the kitchen when they're back. I think so many of us get into this routine and rhythm of wanting to finish because you have a chance to finish with overheads, especially if you're a power player that has an aggressive overhead, mix it up when they're back with the soft touch uh, volley dink uh, when you're in an offensive overhead exchange, if that makes sense. So, so with defense, keep them back, 
but make them run forward. A lot of the times, even if they're athletic, they'll run up there and get a paddle on it. But then that's when you can finish back in their face. So um, it's it's uh, it's really, really smart to try and bring your opponents up when they're back and when they least expect it is on these overhead uh, exchanges. So those are my two. Well, Stolp, you surprised me. You are smart. <laughs> uh timmy what how what okay, do you smart do? thing that i do yeah so yeah normally um i love hitting my fourths and a lot of times i'll be on the left i just feel really confident with a if i'm staring at the guy across from me and he's looking to poach and take up that space you know after the after the uh third is hit to me um i can go down the line on him which is a low percentage shot in my opinion or I can roll it in front of this guy so that he can't poach it. I feel like I do that really well. I love my backhand uh, cross court roll on my fourths. I don't go for too much. I just try to keep it deep. I hit it at the correct angle. And it actually surprised me yesterday, Ian, you and I lost a tough one. Um, and I missed like the very first shot of the game was like that. I'm like, what? It went wide. I don't miss that shot. That's usually a shot that I do really well and I take a lot of pride in. I'm really comfortable hitting. Um, so that's a general thing. But I noticed uh, something that I do that's pretty smart that I'm pretty proud of that I'm going to keep doing even though I'm about to reveal my secret. Um, so a lot of times I'll I'll be on the right because uh, I like my backhand and I'll be playing with, with an alpha. And if that return comes to the middle, a lot of times um, it'll be on my side but just barely and the alpha will um, – leak over into my side of the court and hit a forehand. Um, a lot of times it'll be an inside out drop. So it's going to the guy right in front of me on the right side. I will cut across and, and cover that space that my partner is, is leaving open and I will attack um, their fourth shot off of that drop. Um, so it's a poach. And um, I don't yell switch or anything. I just take the middle from that uh, from that point on. And it's a pretty aggressive tactic, but I think it maximizes um, the amount of space that we're leaving uh, that's vulnerable. And, and we can make up for that. And I can use my alpha mentality from the right side. So that's something uh, smart that I do. Yeah. And it's, it's like Stolp is saying, you got to be willing to cut it short. Well, yeah, but you can cut it short, but you have to prove that you can put away balls first. It's the same, same thing with you, Tim. It's like, yeah, you can get up there, poach, completely take over the middle. And if you prove you can do that, then you just petrify the other team because they they just can't be aggressive because they know. And, you know, maybe one out of every handful of times they can beat you, but no one's going to willingly walk into, you know, that's the thing you do well. No one's going to willingly engage in that with you if they have a way out. So, like, as a smart play of – it's overly aggressive, but it can also slow the play down a lot that allows your your alpha, who's on your left side, to actually get in. Um, what do I do that's really smart? I'm going to steal a page out of Stolp's playbook and say two things. The first one was already briefly alluded to, and Jesse's mentioned in the past that I'm really good up at the net, particularly dinking. And, well, one, having the counter punch is nice because you can kind of assume – if you're attacked, you can handle it. And then if you can dink, you never have to speed up. But I'm really good at constructing points, moving people around, being aggressive with very unattackable shots, right? So, like, I'll dink it here, then I'll dink it out there, then I'll come back here, then I'll come back here, and, oh, now the middle's open. And so just moving people around and being extraordinarily patient with setting the points up but all, but all the while being aggressive without exposing yourself. And I think I do that at a really high level. It allows my alphas, because I'm mostly doing that in the beta side, it allows my alphas to put away shots because I know how to get them involved. And that bleeds into my second thing I do really well. It's knowing where my partner is and what they're good at. So I know how to give particularly Stolp and Tim, I know exactly the types of balls you want to receive to put them away. And I'm pretty good at making that happen, creating my opponents, forcing them into that situation. But if 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 Stolp goes for an Ernie 
and they play it softly past you, I'm not going to speed it up. I'm actually going to cross court dink it back to my side. It's a longer shot, so it extends the time the ball is in the air. It goes away from his side of the court to give him time and no pressure to reset. And I know where it's going so that I can then shift over and cover. So it's just knowing, being so intentional about the pace at which you're playing. You can be aggressive but patient and know where your uh, your partners are and set them up and not expose them. Because if it becomes chaotic, some people will get antsy and ramp it up and ramp it up and ramp it up and just keep escalating. It's like, no, if your partner's out of position, slow the ball down particularly in a place that doesn't expose them or won't get them in trouble. And I think I do that at a very high level because I love what I give my alphas a lot of leeway to just you know, let their freak flags fly, be crazy, go, go out, push their boundaries, but they will always get out of position or, or it, it, that's, it, that's an inevitable portion of it. How can I reset all the momentum and the chaos back to neutral? Um, that's something not a lot of, I've seen a lot of people have, and I take it for granted that I do it so well because I get next to someone and uh, it, where I'm probably the stronger player and I try and make something happen and I'm way out of position. And then they make a choice. I'm like, did you intentionally sabotage me? Like, I don't know why you would ever think that was the shot you had to make there. Did you not see that I was off the court? I just went for an Ernie. I'm not there. Why are you taking that shot selection? So anyway, that turned into a little bit of a mini rant, but but that's what I do well, I think. Agreed. As an alpha, I can say you set us up, set me up very, very well. And, and especially with that timing, you allow me to do off ball movement so that I can come back knowing that not every Ernie attempt is going to be successful, you know, and, and that's important for me to get back and extend the point. Um, and that's a that's great recognition from from a beta. Yeah. All right, guys, we're we're running out of time here. Oh, Tim, you're on mute. I was just gonna Go say, ahead. I all I know is I see a I see a lot of easy looks when I'm playing with you. I don't know what you're doing or why. I just see a lot of easy looks. So it's good to know that it's all intentional <laughs> on your part. Yeah, to to a fault perhaps sometime. Jesse, any anything to add? Where we're button right here at the hour. No, I've got nothing to add. Awesome. And guys, what I, I also, I, in my notes, I wanted to talk about more. We're so good at doing this. You know, we're just like, do we have enough content? Do we have enough questions? Like four questions. And we, we you know, we go in half an hour here. But I wanted to talk about the Louis rule, covering the middle. Um, I did talk about slowing the pace down. Um, when the, is, when things are getting away from you, you can win with more placement. It's, it, placement over power. Uh, let's let's do a lightning round really quick. Just just oh, let's oh. go around the horn to end, end the show and say what are what are some of the things that we see that are really really smart from people we play with? Or how uh, may, maybe can I tweak it? What's the correct way? What if you had to tell someone play smart? Boom 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 boom. Here's how you would lay that out. How would you answer that? Stop. Play with Eric Lewandowski, like <laughs> that's my short answer. Like everything that guy does is is smart. Shot selection, going down the line. The Lou, he's got a rule named after him. Um, but if in a lightning round example with with how to play smart, like this guy defends, blocks, resets. Like be good at the fundamentals and and don't be dumb. That's that's really my lightning round answer. Tim, lightning round. What is what is smart play? Yeah, if you're trying to get into the net um, and you see that your opponent has started their swing, just stop wherever you are. Stop. Mm. And and be willing to block back and reset whatever comes at you. Don't freak out. Stop trying to be aggressive. Just stop right there and and take it easy. You're fine. Mm. Awesome. Jess. Don't rely on your prejudice or stereotypes. Look at what's unfolding in front of you. Find your opponent's weakness. Find what they don't want you to do, and then do that as quickly as possible. See that that's so good because I, I love that because that's not how I think. I think of on our side of the court. Watch your spacing. Know where your partner is. Know what they do well. Play within yourself. Simpler is better. Power is never is rarely the answer. Be patient, right? But all those are like beta, beta. 
Sorry, I had to get a cough out there. But yeah, I mean, we could, guys, we could do three more episodes probably on on Stupid Pickleball. But we got to get out of here and get our days rolling. So listeners, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Pickle Bros Podcast. Please comment or email us. Uh, Our email is picklebros002 at gmail.com. Email us any stupid stories. Comment on, on on the YouTube in the comments. Let us know all the stupid stuff that you do. Um, we really do enjoy uh, going through those comments, and we've even brought several of them up. So I think that this is a topic that that we would be able to bring up some of our, our, our listeners' commentary. Um, but subscribe, share us around. We appreciate everybody's support. We love you all. Stay safe and stay out of the kitchen.